and you don't get much more experienced and creative than the engineering practice set up by Ove Arup, uh, who's the man, remarkably, uh, who managed to get the Sydney Opera House standing up. And if you can do that, you can do more or less anything. And indeed, Arabs have gone on to do many, many things. Uh, and Roger Milburn uh, is a gentleman who's worked with Arab over the last 35 years. And for most of that time, he's had a deep concentration on the city center of Manchester. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Milburn. Thank you for that. I always like to be called solid. That's very useful. <laughs> Take it as a compliment. Um, so my presentation is going to be slightly different. It's the other end of the spectrum from Simone's presentation. It will very much focus on digital uh, representation of cities rather than sketching. Um, models have always been important to um, planners and designers in illustrating what they hope to achieve. Um, over the years, these models have become much more sophisticated. And what my talk will illustrate is how we've moved from visualizations to much more interactive modeling to help us with some of our decision making. And what we try and uh, do is to create models which better understand not just the design, but the context in which the design is being um, placed in, what we sometimes call as placemaking. So I'm going to touch on how visualization modeling has changed over the last 20 years. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on what we call the Arab city modeling. So I'm going to start with visualizations, always been important, always been important that they are uh, validated. And I'm going to, this will be a bit of a theme for me, accuracy, validation of models. Important that they're accurate and that they are ultimately trustworthy. But they're very important to get across very high and sometimes sensitive concepts. So they're a very important part of the repertoire of our toolkit going forward as designers and planners. I'm going to touch a little bit on um, building information system. Just a little bit here to say that this is not new. It's been around since the 70s. In fact, the illustration on here was something done at Heathrow Airport um, back in, um, in the 90s. So it's not a new concept at all. But I'm going to come back to that in a little more detail as I go through the presentation. I'm going to start here with what is probably the beginning of what we term city modeling. And, and the illustration here on the screen shows the state of the, of the footbridge after the bomb and the, uh, the visualization um, of the bridge, which was designed by Hodder and Arup. A lot of this work was initiated by a guy called Simon Maybe, which some of the people in this room will know about. Lots of people in this room, particularly uh, the speakers, were involved with the planning that went forward from um, 1996. I d do not intend to focus on that area in this little talk. What was different about the model here, and uh, Yes, the visualization was there, but it, it really was a proper, accurate, digital, interactive model, which be has become more and more sophisticated as we move through. It also became an important tool for the communication of all the good ideas that were being brought forward after the bomb. As an engineer, methodology, quality assurance, accuracy, evidence are all key parts of what we do. Um, the techniques involved in collecting data for a huge area are now quite straightforward and traditional, using LiDAR data, which has defined levels of accuracy, probably at an aerial level about plus or minus 150 millimeters, but at ground level, less than 10 millimeters. So these are true, truly accurate uh, models that can be used. Basically, we're talking about 3D um, collection of data using la um, laser data. So what's on screen is a very early piece of work um, where the model really comes into its own when you model in large areas, large complex areas that are going to change over the next 10, 20, or even 30 years. 
The example here is Ancoats, which will be very familiar to lots in this room, but for those that aren't, it's um, one of the places that is down as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Ancoats Urban Village Company was created in 1996, coincidentally, again with the bomb. And um, back in 2000, we were commissioned to develop an interactive digital model. And the importance of this model was that it could be used by multiple architects at the same time, all using the same data platform, all being able to share their ideas as we went forward. It proved particularly useful in discussions with CABE when we're trying to put a new building next to a sensitive or historic building because you really were getting a true three-dimensional representation of what would happen. In fact, they were keen to put extra stories on certain buildings once they'd seen the, the model and they could walk around it in real time. The other part of this model that was very um, important to the client was it was very cost-effective. Rather than paying time and time again for different models to be created each time a new design was put forward, the same model was used throughout uh, by different architectural teams. The model's fairly basic at this point, and you'll see that as we go forward, they get more sophisticated. I was asked to put an illustration in about how the model can be used with historic buildings, and this has um, been known to quite a few of you, uh, Harper Hay uh, Victorian Bass. Um, and this was where we used um, LiDAR technology both to not just survey the external, but also the internal um, layouts of the building. And um, moving forward, uh, we took direct um, that information and converted that into detailed drawings, which were then used for both the design and the construction. These shots on the screen show some very subtle differences between what did exist and what was planned to exist. And again, getting this through the sort of heritage approval system proved a very powerful um, tool a tool that you could maneuver around externally and, more importantly, internally. Yeah, models are not particularly cheap to create, and there's no point um, trying to produce a model that's very sophisticated and very high-end in terms of its rendering. So you can, you can stop the model at any point. So you can go from a very basic model, which is the one at the top, to a fully rendered version later on. The whole idea of the, the, the city model concept um, that Manchester has is that as people use it, they add to the model and they contribute their, their thinking and their new ideas into the model in a, in a controlled environment. So it's continually being improved and built upon. But this is the sort of scale that the, the model is capable of working. Too. This happens to be a shot of Sheffield, um, and you, one of my key ideas here would be that all cities should have a, a model that is freely available to everyone who uh, is the designer and a planner and the community to use and interrogate. So I'm just going to touch on a few other things that the model can be used for, because it's not just about thinking about the, how it will look in the built environment. So there's a whole range of uses that the same model can be put through. And again, this is another idea I want to make sure you get to. It's the same information being used differently, different layers through a GIS platform, being used time and time again. So the first is, we've talked a little bit uh, this morning about the importance of engaging with people. It is a fantastic communication tool. It's not many people actually can read drawings, certainly not many of the general public and some politicians. And even when people say they can read the drawings, uh, it's perhaps the case that they can't read them, but they're not prepared to admit it. But a three-dimensional model is much more convenient and, and gets the idea across much quicker and much more pleasant to, uh, to look at than some of the technical reports that engineers produce. So this particular model, very basic model, that is for the Corridor Manchester. Um, Corridor Manchester has used the model to help it think forward. It's got a multiple partnership 
Um, if, for those that don't know Corridor Manchester, it runs basically from the library all the way up Oxford Road to the Whitworth Art Gallery, a very important part of the city centre. Not only has it been used for new buildings, public realm, um, it's also, in this particular example, been used when um, Transport for Greater Manchester decided they're going to make it a bus-only corridor. It is one of the busiest bus corridors in Europe. And when we're talking about bus stops on this corridor, we're talking about 100 metres long bus stops. So a lot of integration, a lot of difficult issues, particularly with cyclists and who's building that these bus stops were going to be placed in front of. So we did a lot of work with all the partners, including TFGM. Models like this don't need to stop at surface level, and this particular example is showing how we captured all the existing services using various radar techniques. So all the existing services are plotted in the same model, and you can imagine if we were in London using tunnels, tunnels and tubes everywhere, the underground map of, of London, literally the underground map of, Mar of London is really important. And who knows, one day Manchester might have its own underground tube system as well. That's an interesting discussion point for later. And you can switch different layers of information on and off so that you can actually interrogate it. The point I'm making here is this is not a visualization tool anymore. This is now being part of the design process. Another useful um, way of using the model is using real-time data. So the, the screenshot that you have there is from a transport model. So those that may have seen in the past um, TFCM model of, of how the buses will move up and down the corridor, they're real-time traffic data. They're not just some computer person um, normally putting buses and cars onto, uh, onto a road. They're from real data. So it's just a way of interpreting and illustrating that data. So the final shot here is that um, the end product for Transport for Greater Manchester was to create a video using the model right down to where every single white line on the road was, boring but important stuff, where the cyclists would move, how they would move and interchange with the buses and, uh, in a safe manner. So again, multiple uses of the same data. It's not just about buildings and, and vehicles. These models can also then be used to look at people movement, both people through um, the design of a, a, a building or a concourse, and more importantly, sometimes um, through an emergency evacuation use. And all of these are accurate um, and have all been predicted. In fact, some of the crowd movements, a bit like the Lord of the Rings, you actually put psychology into a number of them who get confused in Lord of the Rings. In all the battle scenes, 10% of the people sort of run the other way. So next time you see it, have a little look for that. Again, more of a visualization, but equally in real time, you can start to plot how different buildings and different parts of a city are performing. This particular one is about energy use. And there's some work we've been doing with the University of Manchester where we're gathering real-time energy information on different buildings. So people who are responsible for that energy monitoring can actually do something about it. It's not just static data, it's real-time data. This is a piece of work um, from Leeds where we've actually mapped potential heat mapping for energy where, where there's potential to... Uh, to start to use things like heat networks to service various parts of the city. Another example is noise breakout. Um, explaining to people how noise will migrate and break out from a, a venue, such as the one on the, the screen. No points for guessing where that one is. But you can actually, if I've got this um, video running, you would see the pulses of the sound and where they actually radiate to and what the intensity of those um, um, sound breakouts are. So again, another application of the same, same data set. 
Models like this have been used by a number of cities to help promote. They're, they're, they're found to be sort of quite um, innovative, if I could say that, and sexy in terms of trying to um, promote their cities. So Mipin, a few of you around here will have been to Mipin, been used to promote, also been used at things like the Liverpool International Business Festival. Um, so they are a powerful communication tool to bring people into the city who, to, for investment, who aren't familiar with the city and can see the plans for the next 10, 20 years. As an engineer, we get involved a lot in the issues of flooding, which is a, becoming a real issue around here. Those of you that will remember the Boxing Day floods in Manchester, that was a pretty serious event. Didn't quite get the coverage that it might have done if it was in the southeast, but nevertheless, two and a half thousand people, homes were, were damaged and about 500 businesses in a one day event. Engineers normally provide lots of data, which is hard to understand. So the model again comes into its own. So this, this is an image uh, actually of Leeds showing the, the before, showing the after, and that's an immediate visual impact of what can happen if you don't carry out the flood protection works which are inconvenient and costly to the public purse. Just another example before and after. So my argument there would be this is a much more powerful means of communicating that information than flat boring reports. Digital models aren't everything. Quite a lot of people like physical models. Another great advantage of a 3D digital model is that you can actually do a 3D printout. Um, this particular one is um, a part of Sheffield. So you can have a small model that will fit into your um, bag, or you can have a large, several meter side one. All from the same base information. Again, you're not repeating things, you're just reusing the same data. Um, scale doesn't matter. This is a piece of work we did where we've modeled the entire northwest coastline. It was actually done for the Liverpool um, International Business Festival, where all the major energy and transport links were shown. An interactive model for the general public, but more importantly, it became a, a tool that people have gone on to use to interrogate the robustness of energy and transport throughout that area. Again, we had a three-dimensional model built from the same data. Moving towards the end, but there's a, you know, da dashboards are now extremely popular. Um, again, showing real-time activities that can be linked to the same database that has produced the 3D model or the city model. I'm going to finish up with a couple of slides on um, building information. It continues to move at pace. Um, it's not just a 3D representation. Um, lots of people use it, but to use it properly and to take it to its ultimate level um, it requires a lot of investment in skill. This particular model I'm showing here is the new um, engineering um, complex for the University of Manchester, the Manchester Engineering Campus Development, called MECD for short. And it's a number of, of our ambitions would be that one day all these BIM models are connected in the city model. So you have a fully interactive city model. Because BIM isn't just about creating design information. It's about use after construction, if you get it right, as we get through the various levels of, of, of BIM. So imagine a city model where you could interrogate every building, but more importantly, how each of those buildings was impacting on the city, and particularly the energy and uh, other infrastructure aspects. We're a little way off that, but it's 10 years in, in uh, the world of ICT is, um, is a long time. So I'm optimistic we'll see that certainly in, uh, in quite a few of your lifetime. And it will help us to plan and operate our cities in a much more efficient and effective manner.
So, in my opinion, I can see no reason why all cities don't have some sort of city model that they own, that they are custodians for, but that they share with everybody. And everyone then uses the same database um, throughout. A model that can be used not just to illustrate um, what is to come, but also to interrogate and to challenge and to communicate with a whole host of stakeholders. It avoids a lot of waste, duplication of effort, and becomes a, something that I mentioned before, something that's accurate, it's got a database behind it, it's got an audit trail, and it therefore can be trusted. And it can be used again and again for many, many different reasons. Some of the things perhaps we haven't even thought of yet, it will be used for in the future. So multiple layers of stored data. So my argument is it's a valuable tool to help in placemaking. Um, happy to take some discussions in a moment, but the full potential of the model really comes when it is used uh, in an interactive way in a full three-day uh, version um, where you can interrogate it. And the screenshot I'm showing at the moment was produced probably four years ago, um, and it's moved on quite a pace since there. These are, this is just a video, but you could actually do interrogation of this through using games technology and uh, using real-time data. So my argument is, in the last 20 years, We've moved a long way. Visualizations are important, but we've actually moved to fully interactive, three-dimensional models, and I'm passionate that they actually will be an important tool going forward. Thank you very much. Um, a very early version of, um, of, of Roger's model uh, was on display at uh, MIPIM in the, in the Manchester stand some several years ago. Uh, and it allowed you, with the control of a tracker ball, to make a journey in from Manchester airport to the city centre and then whiz around the city centre a bit. Uh, and I was standing next to this and handing over control of this tracker ball to Ian Simpson, who immediately, of course, flew into the city centre and started looking for his own buildings, as why wouldn't he? And as he got to the Beetham Tower, he said, they've missed the fin off the top. I wish the fuck I had. <laughs>